Hey, hey, welcome back to the show. We got Tony Maritato back on the pod. Uh, we have a reaction to ABC News' recent article that came out on November 18th. Back pain, bum knee, be prepared to wait for a physical therapist. The current number of physical therapists falls short of increasing demand. Tony, why is this relevant? Why are we uh, even considering a reaction to this? What's going on? Dave, I just think this has been a popular topic. You know, I, I, I've been saying forever, every therapist that owns a private practice that I know, the biggest barrier, the bottleneck to growth is finding and hiring new clinicians. And so, you know, this is something that I always struggle with because as therapists, you and I, all of us, we're great problem solvers, but I feel like we're not putting the right effort into solving this problem. So when this article came out, I thought, hey, let me get somebody who's smarter than me on the phone. Let me get somebody who is in the world of acquisitions and practice value. <laughs> I'm talking about you. <laughs> Valuations. And let's let's figure this out because how is this going to impact, you know, the future of the profession? And for me, the eternal optimist, the eternal entrepreneur, every opportunity I see is a positive one. And, and so if there are PT shortages, which I do believe there are, I think we can turn that into something that benefits us, the patient, and the third-party payer if we're dealing with that kind of business model. Is it, uh, I know COVID changed a lot of people and changed a lot of lives. Is it majority that folks left the profession because it wasn't what they thought it was going to be? They wanted to change and do, I don't know, whatever, remote high-ticket sales from home or work for some software company or or something like that? Is Is it some majority percentage of folks that left the profession? Is it some that, have not gone through a DBT program or a PTA program, and that's the bottleneck? If you look inside the article, and I grabbed a couple quotes from the article, but they do reference COVID. They basically indicate that COVID accelerated the migration of therapists who are probably going to retire in several years. Anyway, they just retired sooner. You know, COVID was one of those events that it just accelerated everything. It accelerated technology, accelerated telehealth. It also accelerated the exit of a lot of clinicians probably sooner than they would have exited. So that's part of it. But, you know, I go back to I remember in 2021, 2022, licensed physical therapists working at the hospital in my community, Sarasota, Florida, they were earning about 20 to 22 dollars an hour. You know, and then as we moved into 2005, 2006, the DPT kind of became universal. There, there was this huge loss of graduating clinicians. We went from a bachelor's to a master's, master's to a DPT. And I think that created a vacuum. So you would see, you know, a 10, 12, $15,000 sign on bonus. And you would see people just desperate for clinicians, no matter where you looked in the country. Then, of course, that normalized into like the 2010 to 2015 time frame. But throughout the last 23 years, I've been a practice owner. I've always seen a struggle for other practice owners to find, hire and acquire great talent. And, and they're out there. They're just happy. They're working somewhere. So so I think it's more of a messaging problem than it is the reality that there probably isn't enough physical therapists. I also think that it's a utilization problem. And hopefully we get some time to talk about that today. Is it also the dollar amount of offers out there in terms of like cap salaries or capped uh, bonuses or pay raise? I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of that kind of behind the scenes and I've had several, even full-time physical therapists interview with us. And, you know, for seeing four to six patients a day in our practice going around New York City, four to six, I know you got to travel sometimes between patients, but four to six patients a day where you're free between visits, you can document really quickly. And many therapists, if the pay gap for us, the offer, let's say is even five grand less. So we're maybe five grand less, they will still maybe pick an outpatient clinic to go work at, or some physician owned practice or a PT owned practice. They'll take an offer that's five grand more but then they're treating 12 to 15 or 20 patients a day. Whereas with us, they could have been four to six patients a day. And some days, you know, three or four patients a day or whatever, like very reasonable, very, fairly easy. Like some, some people look, look at our practice, like Sturdy McKee. He's like, Hey, that's like a dream for some physical therapists. Right. Maybe it's not for everyone. Is the pay gap the biggest thing? Is it just, un, it's just not enough compensation for the student loan debt that these DPTs come out of school with? 
No, I just don't think it is. I mean, I know we hear that. I know it's cited a lot. There's a lot of things that are cited in media, like in this specific article. I'm going to read a quick quote. It says, Natalia received her PT doctorate from USC last year. She was recently hired. So this is a new grad in nearby Norwalk with a salary of 95000 a year and a signing bonus and the opportunity to earn even more incentives. That's right out of the article. So, you know, yeah, okay. So students are coming out, 150, 200,000 in student debt, but there are opportunities out there, big money opportunities. Now, like you said, there are also opportunities where it's a therapist that's gonna see 20, 30 patients a day. They're gonna be, you know, just running from patient to patient. They don't have time for documentation. So like anything, there's always gonna be this balance of what is important to you, the therapist? What are you looking for? What does the business have to offer? And is there a proper alignment? And I think we need to have that cultural alignment discussion more frequently. You know, somebody coming to work for you, somebody coming to work for me. Like, I can't pay you what some of the competitors in my area can pay you. I tell you right up front at the interview, I'm not going to pay you as much as everybody else will pay you, but I'll give you more time off. You can set up four day weekends whenever you want. You can take Monday and Friday off as long as you get your patients seen. I'm going to give you more autonomy than anybody else ever would. Like those are the intangibles that I can deliver to anybody who wants to come work for me. And truthfully, what that does is it helps with the cultural alignment because I don't want somebody coming to work for me because they decided 5,000 was worth compromising something in their values. You know, I don't want somebody, I've never hired a person, a therapist who is like, well, if you incentivize me with a $15,000 bonus at the end of the year, I'm going to work harder. That's not the person that I want in my organization. So I think students, I think applicants need to come into the interview with some of this information in their back pocket. So they're like, look, what's really important to me? Maybe the numbers, maybe the money isn't as important as time off, time with family. If I'm planning to start a family, you know, maternity leave. Um, there are so many things like that that go into this. But big picture is I think the responsibility falls back on us, the employers, to be like, hey, what is the opportunity I can create for the best possible clinician? You know, and I think for you with looking at valuations of practices, looking at is this a practice that's worth buying? I think a big component, and I'm asking you, is sustainability. Are you getting a team with that? Are you getting a winning team, a winning culture, or are you just getting a dysfunctional factory that's cranking out units and turning a profit, but as soon as you buy it, it's just going to collapse? Yeah, well, it, it is a good point that you brought up because for us to look at practices, uh, externally and then kind of like a little bit internally as we speak more and more with a practice owner, those are big considerations. Like, do they have a revolving door where, you know, therapists only work there for, you know, one to eight months or something at a time, or there's some therapists that have been there uh, for years and that shows more stability. And so therefore we're going to pay more for that. So this is definitely a consideration, not just for the licensed physical therapists out there that are like looking for jobs and looking for the right fit, but it's also, like you said, for practice owners that are looking to maybe have an exit strategy in the next three to five years. And this is a big component. It's like, you have to kind of have this figured out, like your your metrics and salary and onboarding and the job offers and all of that and attracting great talent that that actually wants to work there, stays there, gets good outcomes, good good results, all that type of stuff. It, it's all part of the equation. So it's it's definitely a factor of what we're looking at in terms of valuations. Now, what I think is interesting about this article is it kind of encapsulates a lot of the conversations that have been going on across social media and throughout the profession. And when I look at this, you know, if I'm in it, boots on the ground, I'm in the clinic, I'm busy, I'm treating patients, it's hard for me to see different perspective. It's hard for me to step back and look at the big picture. But let's hit a couple of these common kind of complaints that I see coming out of this conversation. And I think we need to look from a different perspective. So number one, we see Medicare cuts, right? So declining reimbursement. Medicare is pitching a 3.4% reduction in payment for 2024. I've recorded videos where I go through and show the comparison between reimbursement for 2023 to the 2024 fee schedule. This article cites that it's a 9% reduction in Medicare reimbursement over the last four years. So we're like, okay, business owners are getting paid less. They're under pressure, they can't afford it. 
On the flip side of that, you've got students who have higher uh, student debt. So they're coming out owing more money. And then you throw on top of that inflation, right? And so inflation, food costs more, gas costs more, all of these elements cost more. All right. Most people just stop right there. They're like, this is a horrible situation. I can't believe this. How can we do this? We need more assistance. We need help. We're the victims. You know where that goes. But then I have to step back and I have to look at this and I've shared this perspective a bunch. I'm like, okay, I see that. But on the flip side, me as the business owner, I'm paying a fraction of what I used to pay for stuff like marketing. You know, just a couple of years ago, I would pay $10,000 to get content written for my website that I can get now for 20 bucks a month. I used to pay unreasonable amounts of money to run an ad in a newspaper, which I can do targeted ads with Facebook and Google for fractions of a penny. I mean, I, there are so many big picture, like tens of thousands of dollars of savings that nobody ever talks about. They talk about inflation. They talk about a Chick-fil-A sandwich costing a dollar more, gas being a dollar fifty a gallon more. But nobody talks about the fact that I probably save fifty thousand dollars on a marketing budget today compared to where I was in two thousand one, two thousand two. You know, so what are you thinking? Like, is anybody talking about the reality that technology has compressed the cost of operation so much that we should still be able to run profitable clinics? I, I agree. I do not think we're in the Middle Ages. I think physical therapy is in a renaissance. I think with your content being put out there, mine, Jerry Durham, Pulsing with Strata Studios, Robbie and Joey with Rehab CEOs. Uh, the list goes on and on and on with different YouTube content and different, uh, even Instagram and physical therapists putting, I don't know, workouts and treatments and all this stuff out there. I think we are part of that whole wave where we're getting in front of more and more consumers who are like, maybe questioning orthopods, maybe questioning doctors, maybe taking more of their health and wellness into their own hands. They're being a little bit more um, centric about their their health and wellness, and they're going to be seeking more and more physical therapists out. So that goes back, I agree. So that goes back to cheaper marketing costs for a lot of physical therapists out there that are putting themselves out there, whether it's organic content, YouTube videos, paid ads, whatever it might be. However, we're all getting in front of these, these healthcare consumers. So that's a massive um, reduction in terms of potential marketing costs that we would have had to pay more for prior, um, especially like with practices like yours, where you were significantly relying on physician relationships, referrals initially or over time. And then obviously you built word of mouth, you built, you know, rapport and relationships with your patients. And then those patients kind of self-refer themselves back to your practice or uh, their friends, family, they, you know, they, they tell them about Tony and, and, and total therapy solutions. So that, I think that's part of this current trend with physical therapy. It's, it's conservative. There's basically no side effects. We're not selling, you know, a, a, a pill or snake oil or something that like, you know, might have some major consequences. Like, like I just watched the vaping uh, documentary on Netflix. Like there's no, like that's not gonna happen to any of our patients. It's amazing, it's great. Like, and, and we're, we're providing them with something that I think is unique uh, and it's right. holistic and, and there's no side effects. So I think we're well positioned for a lot of that. We're gonna hopefully as a profession continue to be putting that content out there. And it definitely can over time reduce your marketing spend because there's more and more people, even we go to sleep, we're on the, we're on this video. There's more and more people consuming content, whether it's that ABC article, uh, or if it's something on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or whatever, more and more healthcare consumers are getting smarter about ways that they can do things or find services and physical therapy is in that. So it, it's definitely going to be something that reduces customer acquisition costs. It's kind of like general awareness across the country. Obviously, more markets might benefit more than others but it's definitely part of the conversation. So, you know, I remember again, early 2000s, you couldn't do anything without a brick and mortar clinic, right? And you had rent, you had overhead, you had equipment you had to buy, you had to pay for internet, you had to pay for phone, all this stuff. Now, all of a sudden the move was, all of a sudden I could work out of my car. Now I can work out of my computer. We still have Medicare covering telehealth services through the end of 2024. So even that brings the cost of care down. I'm going to grab another quote out of the article that I think is worth challenging. So this was a quote from James Gordon, Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at University of Southern California. He said, quote, 
what used to be small practices are often being bought up by large corporate entities. Dave, you evil person. <laughs> and those corporate those corporate entities are pushing productivity and become which becomes less satisfying in the workforce. So we see this a lot. I see this complaint constantly. It's like, oh, greedy corporates, they want nothing but profit. <laughs> Look, guys, we, we can all admit, even the most left-wing liberal of us can admit the business needs to be profitable. An element in this that, again, never gets discussed is, yeah, but with that, you bring economies of scale, first of all. So when I was operating five clinics across two states, it was way less expensive for me to deliver the service compared to when I had one clinic in one location. Because if somebody was out six, I had redundancies in the system, out sick. I had redundancies in the system. It was cheaper for me to submit claims. It was cheaper for me to admit patients and do administrative work just because I could share the cost across five clinics, five locations. You know, if I have one clinic, I probably need 100,000 in profit from that clinic. But if I have 10 clinics doing 100,000 or doing 10,000 a piece, obviously I can make the same profit. Just scale brings economy. And that's what we get with these roll ups. That's what we get with these acquisitions. So I understand the therapist frustration, but I think it opens up new opportunities for us. And my thing goes back to what are we? Let's turn the mirror around on ourselves. What are we doing to bring down the cost of physical therapy services, physical therapy care? Every time I ask this question, I get global answers. It's like, oh, well, physical therapy, if you can avoid a total knee replacement, then we're saving, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to the system. I get it. I get it. For for 20 years, I've seen therapists try to convince employers that if they hire a therapist in-house for a factory, there's going to be less workers' comp claims. I know. But that's that's too intangible. That's too big picture. I want to know concrete. So like when we look at hip replacements, right? 20 years ago, hip replacement, they get it done. They refer to therapy. 24 visits, almost guaranteed. Then it went to 12. Then it went to none. Like I haven't seen a patient after a hip replacement in my clinic for like three years. It just doesn't happen anymore because the procedure has gotten so good. The outcomes are so good. They don't need what we used to do as therapy. And so when I look at my caseload of total knee replacements, right, I ask in my Facebook group, who has been told you're not going to physical therapy? And there's a large cohort of patients who get a total knee replacement and they're specifically told you are not going to therapy. The one side says, oh, well, that's because greedy surgeons and doctors and insurance companies want to take all the money and they don't want to pay rehab. But the reality is a lot of these patients are doing great. You know, a lot of these patients are getting a full recovery. So when I look at how can I optimize and bring the cost of care down for my services that I deliver, I look at, okay, do I really need 60 minutes with every patient? Eh, probably not. I'm a better therapist today than I was 20 years ago. I can probably deliver better value in 15 minutes than I could in 60 minutes. Plus, in 15 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, you and I, Dave, can sit here and talk for 15 minutes. Five minutes later, you probably forgot half the stuff that I said. If you and I sat here and talked for 60 minutes, I guarantee you forgot 95% of what I just said. You know, so I would rather see you for 15 minutes, five times a week, instead of 120 minutes over two times a week. I save the payer. I think there's a better patient care experience and a better outcome. I improve um, compliance and, and you know, you, you as the patient can come in and kind of do the stuff more frequently. And guess what? I make a ton more money. I eliminate MPPR, if people know what that is. Um, I, I get paid so much more from the same payers that are cutting rates on everybody else. I just double and triple my profit. I dramatically increase my revenue. So I, I, I want to hear your thoughts. You know, what do you see in regards to how we can take accountability and responsibility for what we're doing, reduce the waste, improve the efficiency, and really focus on better outcomes? Well, I commented on a, a recent video of yours, uh, and I said, and I was, so I was disagreeing uh, on this. Like I said, on your, I commented, I said, when I go into Whole Foods, if I go into the Apple store, if I'm shopping for car insurance, whatever, it doesn't feel like any of these other companies are looking out for me and saving me money. 
or looking out for, you know, low, how can they lower their cost of goods? Now, of course, there's places like Costco and all that that have like a different business model. And arguably, you could say maybe they do. Uh, maybe and maybe we can learn from that. I don't know. Maybe there needs to be a physical therapy membership. And then, you know, you charge everyone like a one unit, you know, visit through their insurance. I don't know. Maybe that's a thing. Um, but I commented, I, I commented on on your video recently, maybe in the past few days. And I said, yeah, if I go into Whole Foods, whatever, it doesn't feel like any of these bigger companies are looking out for me in terms of like saving me money. So why should we? Why should physical therapy? I mean, I feel like, again, there's no major side effects. There's no real drawbacks. Um, you can have a licensed uh, DPT kind of help you through an orthopedic or a neurological condition or pelvic floor, wh whatever the condition might be. I believe it's valuable. I believe we have a position in the marketplace. I don't, I think it's, uh, and I also commented on that same comment, maybe it's me being immature or naive, but I don't understand why you are suggesting we try to save healthcare consumers or save patients money when what we have, we're trying to say, hey, it's valuable and here's the market, here's the here's the results and here's who we can help and and all that. So it's like, we wanna attract all these patients but at the same time, it's like maybe, maybe we're trying to, you want to save the money and only do like one unit visits or whatever. I don't know if I fully understand it. I don't know if I can grasp it. And if I can't, then maybe I'm immature or naive. No, not at all. Like that's the best part of you and I having these talks is that we have differing opinions. We don't agree on one-on-one -on -one care. We don't agree on in-person care. There's a lot of things we don't agree on. But what I think is interesting is it highlights the fact that even two physical therapists can say, I am a physical therapist, and it can be worlds apart of what they actually do in a day. I want to be mindful of your time. So maybe we'll wrap up on this point. But when people say, oh, you don't want to get into a race to the bottom, you don't want to commoditize care, you don't want to reduce the value, you know, under pricing, blah, 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 blah. I always go back to them like, look, I go to McDonald's sometimes, look at McDonald's annual report, look at their profit margins. They're in the 30% profit margin range. Like that is crazy. McDonald's just prints money. How do they do that? Do they provide the best hamburgers? Of course not. They optimize for efficiency. They deliver a product. And you know what? If the consumer didn't like the product they deliver, the consumer would stop going. You know, we hear therapists talk about, oh, corporate PT, it's horrible and, and it's a factory and it's a mill. McDonald's is all of those things and they have a dedicated community that goes to them every single day because it's consistent, it's reliable, it's affordable, and they make a ton of money doing it. They make a ton of money doing it. On the flip side, you've got Ruth's Chris. We're coming up on our, don't quote me on this, 17 year anniversary, right? I'm gonna take my wife out. She just had a birthday. Like, I'm not gonna take her to McDonald's. I'm gonna take her to a premium steakhouse. I'm gonna spend $150, $200 because I'm not spending that much per meal. I'm not spending that money on the food. I'm spending that money, one, to show my wife how much I love her, two, to enjoy the ambiance and and the feel of the silverware and the white the tablecloth. The experience. Yeah. So, so, you know, let's not confuse the fact that what you're doing, which is amazing, like I look at you and I love my being able to watch you and live vicariously through you. That's not my business. Even though you and I are both in the quote physical therapy business, your business is not my business. I wouldn't enjoy your business. I, I don't feel good in that world anymore. That's not something that I want to do these days. And so with that, yeah, for my audience, for my consumer, my consumer is the insurance company. I want to provide the greatest value. And if I do that well, not only can I serve my customer, the insurance company better, I can also expand access to the consumer who says, I'm not gonna pay 50 bucks. I'll deal with the shoulder pain. My shoulder pain is not worth $50 a session or $150 a session. But I want access to the consumer who's like, it's $15. For $15, I'll come to what you're calling physical therapy. I'll do what you want me to do or what you recommend I do. And some of them are gonna feel better and some of them are gonna do it because their wife's nagging them to go. Some of them are gonna do it because the doctor said they have to go. You know, here in Midwest, Ohio, like, we get a lot of patients that, that come to us, high deductible, high copay, lots of expense. They can't afford it. They're not interested in it. It's not that much of a priority for them. But if I can craft an experience for a hundred bucks a month, you can come as much as you want. hundred bucks a month. I'll get you the outcome that you're looking for that I can deliver. Let me change it to the outcome I can deliver. 
they'll do it all day long, you know, and, and it gives me so many opportunities, reduces barriers, all the stuff, all the reasons why I became a therapist. So different businesses. So the comparison of your practice, let's say if you were shifting more toward like one unit, reducing costs for patients, first of all, that, that sounds great, especially for, I mean, a lot of places across the country. I'm sure a lot of consumers will love that. And that that's awesome. You gave the comparison to McDonald's where it's like the scale and the efficiencies that they have. They pass that down to the consumer because they have everything dialed in. They have great profit margins, but they serve like they're, you know, the dollar menu. I don't know if that's still around or like things like that where it's very inexpensive. So that's kind of what you're talking about as right. a potential route. Um, but you now you are great because you've been around for so long and you have, you know, the YouTube videos and all that other practices in Ohio or other states have to get even better than you or or better than they are now with marketing if they're going to go on volume. For us, we're more boutique, right? So we're charging a lot more per visit, and our volume is less. And so yeah, you and I are different. Like you're in wherever you're at right now, even if it's two, three, four units per visit on average that what you guys are doing, you are, you're at a higher volume per day and per week than, than what we are. And we're charging more per visit. So of course, we're going to be lower volume. If a practice owner is watching or listening, and if they wanted to go that route of like, hey, let's try to save the consumer money. Let's do, you know, one or two unit visits and, you know, reduce the cost for them. They have to get even better with marketing. They have to have more patients coming in the door and calling. That's one reason I think there, there, there's this, this I don't know, bottleneck is maybe part of it with like consumers and access. And we're talking about wait lists and all that because they want to get more patients in the clinic. They want to keep it at maybe the four or whatever units per per visit. They're they're doing as, you know, 30 minute visits or 60 minute visits, whatever it might be across outpatient clinics, even if they're in network. And they're 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 not they're in the middle of you and I. It's like if you're saying maybe more one unit visits and, and trying to save the consumer money, and I'm like, well, we're gonna do one hour visits, we're gonna travel to you, it's gonna be through your out of network insurance. If you don't have that, it's gonna be, you know, two or three hundred bucks a visit, whatever it might be. So you and I are maybe the opposite ends. A lot of practices watching or listening are in the middle, and that's why they're getting jammed up, right? hundred percent. I've said it forever. You can't live in the middle. None of us are designed to live in the middle. The middle is the red ocean. We want to find those blue ocean opportunities. That's going to be the the half a percent at the very low end or at the very high end of cost. That's where we want to be. That's where we're going to find the most success. Real quick, just to clarify, you're using the word high volume. I would not use the word high volume because I would measure volume based on units. So a therapist delivering one unit to four patients in an hour or four units to one patient in an hour, it's still it's four same. units. It's the same okay. exact volume. It's just a different way to deliver the units and who you're delivering it to. And then the last part of it is, you're right. Like, let's finish this episode on you are 100% right. Every problem in the clinic almost comes down to better marketing. I need to recruit the best therapist. How do I do that? Better marketing. I need to get more patients in my clinic if I want to do single unit visits and make more money. How do I do that? better marketing. And what's marketing? Marketing is just communication. It's it's people talking, it's sharing the passion, sharing the interest, sharing what's important to you in a way that the other person can understand it. And then it either resonates with them or not. You know, you and I connected years and years ago because we resonated with the messages that we were sharing both ways. So yeah, everything goes back to better marketing. Right. And shout out to Rob Vining. I don't know. I have no idea if he's watching or listening to this, Rob, wherever you are in the world. We miss you, man. Uh, we haven't talked to you yeah. in a while. And the reason why Tony and I are on this video right now is partly because of Rob Vining, because he got me on video and, and podcast and all that. So shout out, Rob. I agree. He was a great guy. I appreciate him. Hopefully he's doing well. Awesome. Well, subscribe to the Dave Kittle Show on YouTube. Also, jump over to Learn Medicare Billing, LearnMedicareBilling.com, as well as Learn Medicare Billing on YouTube. Tony's got a plethora of videos to help you navigate Medicare and billing and a whole bunch of other creative marketing ideas and much, much more. Go check them out. Uh, Tony, thanks for your time. It was awesome. Dave, thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com. Or you can call me at any time, 
781-8884.